he just gets up and bam, yeah. help, fire, fire, fire. <laughs> and I realized that you still can see Billy's Face. handprint on my face. You can see like like two of his fingers, fingers right now. I'm like. <laughs> Hey, this is Matt Cox. Yeah, I don't know why you're doing that. It's on me. Oh. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I'm here with Zach, and we are going to be going over the RDAP program. Residential drug. Abuse. Treatment. Uh, residential drug ab abuse program. RDAP. Uh, RDAP. R residential. Residential. R. D drug, for drug. A. Ab abuse. P, P for, for program. program. Okay. Right. So you say RDAP, and then people still say program. Whatever. So it's the RDAP program in federal prison, which Zach went through and passed, and I went through twice and didn't pass <laughs> by purpose. Not that I couldn't have passed. I may not have been able to pass, honestly, but I, I would have passed, but it would have been hell the very last phase. But anyway, and I knew that, and it was I had a whole different agenda, which you could read in my book. Like, what a, what a selfless – what a, what a plug. Um. Okay, so – Check out the video. It's going to be funny. Zach is very funny. Zach had a vastly different experience with RDAP, although both of us like the program. And, uh, yeah, it's it's good stuff. It's Survivor meets Federal Prison. Um, I'm spitting. It's Survivor meets Federal Prison Drug Program. Yes. Yeah. So um, just you have to point out the fact that I was in a penitentiary. Right, you're where they're sound, stabbing and you death. make me sound soft, and and you were in a low, yeah, bro, where listen, there's harsh language. I was gonna say, people, and, hurt. And, I got and, my feelings hurt email. once. I'm, I'm sure, I'm yeah. sure. So, and and that's that's a major difference to do it at a pen. As a matter of fact, I had an opportunity to go somewhere else and do it. Right, to wait a year and go somewhere else and do it because they were so desperate for people at the pen. I said, I'm gonna go ahead and do it now while I'm here. I'm like, why? wait and go somewhere else when I can jump in this one right now. And, and cause I, I qualified for the year off with the murders and killers. Yes. I said, I'm going to jump in and do it with the murderers and killers yeah. <laughs> because I qualified for the year off, get my year off now. Cause I got it off. Like I got my year off like three years before I was due to be released three or four years before I was due to be released. So from RDAP. From RDAP. Right. So, so once, if you if you complete the program, the RDAP program, which is a nine, if you don't get held back, the RDAP, look real quick, the RDAP program right. is a program where inmates go into a special unit. They go, they're retrained or re-educated for nine months. And during, and at the end of that nine months, really during the por portion of that nine months, the one, you get one year off of your sentence. Now, if you for fail qualified, for qualified inmates, for qualified inmates, you get because some some inmates did not like if they had a violence in their past or a, a gun charge or or some kind of a, a, you know, whatever. Anyway, algorithm, some kind of issue with pictures um, that <laughs> or video, whatever gang, they're gang, whatever. making gang poses. But anyway, yeah, go yeah. Ahead. <laughs> so. Then they don't get they don't get the the time off. But if you qualify, you take the course, the, the program, you pass it, then you get a year off your time. So you, well, you get a year in the halfway house if you didn't qualify for the year off. Well, I didn't get a they, year. Well, oh, well, well, they they would qualify you for more halfway house time. Supposedly, supposedly. right? Not mo I know lots of guys that only got four and five months. You know, off. I, I mean the halfway. Anyway, Obama kind of right. ruined that when he right. the well, halfway house he, used to have one person. They'd have ten people in one bed. Yeah, and they, they charge ten people to be there. Right, and and he's like, you can't do that anymore. Right, here's what halfway houses were doing: they would chart, they would have an inmate would get out of prison, go to a halfway house, and they would they would charge them for the government for that bed. Let's say they're charging a hundred dollars a day for that inmate. Then they would put the inmate on an ankle monitor and tell and 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 so they monitor him at home. And then they would tell the Bureau of Prisons, hey, we have another bed available. They would then put another inmate in that bed, get another $100. So now they're getting $200 for the same bed. They would then move that guy to home confinement. They'd say, hey, we got another bed available. They'd sit, So they end up having 10. Yeah, like 10 <laughs> people in one bed getting paid $1,000 a night for one guy in one bed when really these guys are all on an ankle monitor at home. And so Obama came through and said, what are you guys doing? I feel like you're taking advantage of the system. <laughs> you know, that, and like for us, 
for when for those that are in prison, it was heaven because halfway house are like, come on, more, 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 right. more, so, more. So if you so guys could get ten months, a year, but the problem is when they did that, they no longer had the bed availability, and so people that could have gotten a year ended up getting four months, three months. Oh, it shut down the halfway houses for about eight. It was almost sh- impossible to get in a half. Yeah. When he made that adjustment, it was almost impossible to get in a halfway house for almost a year. Yeah, I went from, like, my halfway house time was adjusted, like, three different times. I even had one time, literally, my mom thought she's coming to pick me up in, like, a week. And when I went in there to say, hey, they're, my family's mailing in stuff. Did you guys get it yet? And and they were like, you're not leaving for two months. <laughs> I was like, what are you, no, no, I have my date. They were like, oh, no, that changed. When did that happen? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway, I'm sorry. But no, no problem. So, um, RDAP, for those that didn't get the year off, Basically, um, they'd offer you more halfway house time. Now, see, what's funny about that situation is, in my view, being at the pen, I felt like everyone at the low qualified for the year off. I, I felt like it was the year off that would keep people in line that would make it very imperative to be there. Right. And having to, when you're living in a unit where everything you do is like you're in a fishbowl where not only is the are the staff watching you, but you they've set up a program to where other inmates are watching you. Oh, absolutely. And and so your everything you do is subject to scrutiny based on the program. Yeah. But tell them tell them a little bit uh about the the program and the requirements so um, everybody understands. Well, I mean, so it, first of all, it's it's really not a drug program, right? No. So to get it through Congress, I'm sure they called it a drug program, but really the program is about behavior modification, right? So yes. they're trying to modify your thinking errors. And this is a funny thing is like prior to going through that program, I would have told you that like, oh, these guys are locked up because, you know, yeah, they don't follow rules. very. Like I, I, I very quickly summed it up to, well, they don't follow rules that well. But the truth is when you go through the program, you realize that that the people that are locked up have fundamental problems processing um, situations in general, you know, and, and, and I mean, to a degree where you're like their, their immediate leap is like violence or breaking the law or, or just in pure insanity. And you realize like, bro, like that's your first thought is that like yes. they're, they're like, yeah. And you're like, oh, wow. And then you start to realize kind of like to me, I realized going through it, I started realizing like. Yeah, my first thought is this. It's not what maybe a, a violent person's is, but it's still not the appropriate response. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that isn't appropriate. And you've never been in a situation where you focus on that. So I, I had never been on, in that situation. So what happens is you wake up early. Like you wake up early in the morning, let's say 6 o'clock. You then have a morning meeting where everybody goes to the morning meeting. And you had, let's say you've got 100 150 guys? Yes. How, but I don't know how many were in your program. Um the pins. about about 100, about 89, 100. Okay. Let's say let's go with 100. It's a better number. I don't know. I think 120 is a full program. Is it? Well, yes. then, okay, then we had we had a full program. So whatever, 120. 120. It's about 60 chairs on each side. Right. But and he, they have you facing they they line the chairs up to where like 60 people are sitting directly across from 60 yes. people. And at the head of that group is a what they call a facilitator that facilitates the meeting, and in the back of that, that those two chairs sitting across from each other are the um, what they call it the D the DTSs the, the DTSs Staff. which are the drug the drug treatment specialists right. that are there. Right. All right. So wait, I want I want you to say this, Matt. This is important because like I loved the program, and I was what they called a super programmer because right. I loved that type of thinking. So I thought it was incredible and awesome. Right. You, on the other hand. See, you, see, we've already had this discussion. So Zach, once again, read my book, which oh, honestly, it's a very short, but it's funny because he, he read it and just laughed his ass off because he's, he's saying he read the book and felt that I did not like the program. I mocked the program the whole time I went through it, but. It's not to say that I don't think it was a good program. And to be honest, I've even had have conversations with Boziak and and um, multiple times I've had short discussions like with Ardap, with this guy, Ardap Dan. Oh, I've never – you got to meet Ardap Dan. Anyway. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he was a super me. dapper. He was super dapper. I, I was a super dapper. Yeah. He, so 
RDAP Dan, we've had this discussion, and both of I, us agree. And Jess, my girlfriend, who passed the program, she'll tell you the same thing. She'll like, I hated every single minute of it. Right. She goes, but I think that every inmate should have to take the program because you learn so much about yourself and you realize how just fundamentally flawed you are. <laughs> and, and, and so instead of your immediate reaction being – you and I have an issue and it's your fault. You learn to internalize things and go, how could I have contributed to this? Is it his fault? Did I contribute? Is it me? Is my Was my reaction to that, that disagreement the correct one? And you really kind of process your, it gives you the ability to process your behavior and your, the way you react to things in a way that you never would have without that. So I think it's a great program, but yes, when I was going through the program, did I mock it mercilessly? Of course, because there are ridiculous things about Abs- it. Absolutely. Yes. So I want to add to what you just said because you're right. And it also gives a little wisdom because the way they categorize everything and they teach you what each behavior and each thought, they place it in a category that what they call that cognitive thinking. Right. It allows you to identify it and give it a name and know what those behaviors are lead to so it it kind of processes your thinking into compartmentalizing which which allows what i noticed is it allows people who had those violent tendencies to actually see the type of errors they have in other people like a lot of times when people got up and talk they'd say you know you're struggling with this which is something i struggle with all the time right so it it, it kind of opens your mind so it Fundamentally, it is good. It, it's it was it was a good program for helping people who didn't have the ability to process start processing, or people who really didn't know how to process. It gave them a process. I saw that in a lot of people, especially those that start and end. It. Some people, some of the success stories have been people who've gotten in there, and when you met them when they started, and you met them when they finished, you're like completely different person yeah so they yeah. do have some success oh yeah L- but L- i was a super dapper so i mean i of course i <laughs> oh no you would see so there were there were people that there were guys in there that of course you have some people that you know they fake it till they you know or they oh, they course. fake the whole program oh yes honestly even the people that faked it still learned something Yes, and they might even there were even guys that pretended to be faking it, but the truth was you could see a a, a difference. It's like I know you're faking because you don't want to get out of here and have all your buddies make fun of you. Because guys that weren't in that group in that program, all the other you got to think. Look, we're talking about eighteen hundred to two thousand people on the low in the low. You've got one hundred and twenty guys in the program, so you've got basically eighteen hundred guys on average making fun of the 120 there in the program. Oh, he's an RDAP. Oh, he's, they're all snitches. They're all snitching on each other. And we'll get to that in a minute, but they're all telling on each other. Oh, you're, you know, you're a sucker. You're this, you're that. Oh, you're, you got them telling you what to do. And ain't nobody telling me what to do. You know, all this. Oh, they would give you a hard time. I don't know if they did in the pen. <laughs> Wait till I tell you that part. Finish. Go ahead and finish. Well, anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so it was, you know, it was a hostile in- environment to be in. And I was gonna say, it's funny too, because look, Let's face it, for me, being in prison, like, I'm a soft white guy. I, on average, I'm an average white guy in society. In prison, my in ma- as far as masculinity is concerned, I'm maybe a five or a six, I think, outside. I'm like a fucking one in prison <laughs> because of masculinity. At a low, you were a one? You had to at least be on no, two. Well, there were the the guys that were there for pictures. Oh. Like if you say by you know the, oh, you, you yeah, have to understand the, the term that oh, I'm yeah. using. If you do, boom. Uh, yeah. No monetization. Understood. Um. So guys that were there because they like to take pictures, and well, and that would have brought you above a one, wouldn't it? I I think it brought me up to maybe a, a two or a three. Yeah. But still, let's face it. You still got the gang members. You got the guys that have been that have murdered people. The guys that have worked their way down from the pen. Oh, listen. And when Obama went through and. He was he Obama after you let the first wave of like a thousand guys go, just let them out. Like half those guys are reoffending, right? Right. Then he realized, wait, stages. I'm gonna re- I'm gonna knock ten years off your sentence, but you have to do one year in the low. Yeah. Then you have to do a year in the halfway house because there was no mechanism for what he was doing. He was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm gonna knock 
uh, yeah, immediate release, immediate release, immediate release. Right. So you just let some guy, like, he doesn't realize, like, you let some guy that's been locked up for 20 years in prison out immediately without halfway house, his family's given up on him. He's got nowhere to go. Of course he's going to go back to crime. It's what he knows. Right. You've got to put him in a halfway house. And then he realized, no, you know what? If they're in the pen, they don't even know how to behave in society. So you got to go from pen, medium, low, halfway house. I, I met a guy in the pen that had to go to the low to take the program. And I kept telling myself, God, I wish I could witness that because you have to complete the program to get out. I go to torment. He's going to go through is going to be unbelievable. Oh, yeah. But. The same guy, Ledford. The guy's name was my, he was my, one of my cellies at one point was a guy named Ledford. Life sentence for meth. Let, listen to this. Life sentence for meth. They told him they would give him like 20 years, but he had to cooperate against his wife, which was involved in it. He said, absolutely not. Give me the life sentence. Gangster. Straight gangster. Right. Goes to prison. She don't last a year. Within a year, she's out with some other guy, divorces him some, with some other guy. Some other guy's calling uh, uh, his kid's fucking daddy, doesn't come visit him. Oh, so, he snapped. No, he didn't. I mean, he he, he did 20-something years. Right. He, he has life. He did right. 20 years, and then Obama came along and said, my God, what are you doing? Like, Obama said, no, no, I'm going to give him. He's going to go to the low. He has to, to pass the program. He has to get out. This guy, one, he was a super dapper. Really? But, but, but totally believed in it. Totally believed in the program. He he was amazing. And of course, got out. By the way, if you like, I'm friends with him on Facebook. This guy got out and hit the ground running. Like he's probably making a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand a year. He's got he's driving an eighty thousand dollar truck. Bought a brand new house. Got out just in time for his dad had died when he got out. Like I mean, this guy, you know, amazing guy. He was, you know, it's meth. It just ruins you. It ruins people. Um, but yeah, he uh uh um yeah he was my my celly. Oh, he too. was a super dapper. He listen. It's oh, amazing who becomes a super I was just dapper. Say, that's what's the funny thing. You don't you don't know the guy you think never. Yes, embraces it. The guy you think, oh, he's going to be fine, can't get through the program. Like right. just can't. Right. You're like, what's going on? Like, what are you doing? It's like, oh, that guy. This. You're like, how and, and are that's you behaving what, like this. And that's what we have to describe is the the torment, the choice mentally that people make to like, you know what? I'm fine the way I am. I'm not even going to embrace what you're saying. Right. But I want to say, like, what you were saying about in in the low, how they made fun of the people in the RDAP. Right. Right. Well, I was in the penitentiary where it was definitely called snitching. And a lot of people were in gangs. So they would have to get permission from the gang to go to RDAP. And what what I thought was hilarious is you they would ask someone, like, hey, I can get a year off my sentence. If I take the RDAP and some of the people, they're like, well, you can take it, but there's certain things you can't do while you're in there. Holy shit. <laughs> it, it, and, like you and, can't, what do you, uh, you call it? They called it help ups. You can't do help ups. You, you can't um, participate in this. And if we hear about you doing that, we're going to, oh, I, many of people I've seen get jump on the compound for doing something in RDAP and a person that just gets in there going, what are you doing? That's snitching. And he's like, no, we, we like, I have no understanding and they're going to jump you and you get beat up and taken off the compound. You can't even do the RDAP. That, and, and, it, it was never that extreme. Oh, yeah. but there that's were the guys. Pen. Yeah, that's the pen. Well, these are guys that are, yeah, they got major, major. These are violent. Listen, and, and I had, we had a DTS that stood up every day and said, I hate gangs because she goes, gang members telling you, that you can't get out of prison early to be with your kids, right. making that requirement. She's like, you should never be a part of crap like that. Which yeah, I'm it, like, yeah, you're right, but uh, it's also it's hard a, to it's not, survival. This yeah. is a, about survival. We they had conversations about that that got one guy, I believe, killed. I don't if he didn't die, he was severely injured. He had to be lifted off of the compound. Did I ever tell you that I I did time in the pen? Did I tell you what happened? No. Yeah. So I got into. Uh, a disagreement with a guy. So we got into a disagreement. Somebody dropped a note on both of us. No, 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 that's not true. That's not true. That's not what happened. That that was a different time I went to the shoe. I've been in the shoe like oh, four times. Oh, the shoe at the at, at the pen in Coleman. Yeah, I was at the low. Right. I get bitch slapped. I'll be honest. I got bitch slapped by a guy. Again? But go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was watching. I'm going to tell you the story real quick. This is perfect, Lou. There's a guy sitting behind me who had... He had a, he was, he was on a, he was a registered, 
Yes. S O. Right. But he was there for he was in Coleman for um, on a on an oxy on a pill case. So and he didn't realize that anybody knew. He knew, but he didn't know. Like what happened was eventually he was so so adamant about about SOs and they're scum fuck, they're this or that. And he was so adamant about snitches and this and that, they're garbage. And so one of the other guys said, you know what? Something ain't right. He's pushing too hard, you know. Thou persist persist too much. Yes, the reverse psychology. Right. So he looks him up, he gets his the, you know, they have a poster. Yes. He gets the poster sent in. And he makes copies of it and passes it out. Right. Of what that's one thing. The second thing is he looks into it and his co-defendant comes on the compound at the same time and said he cooperated. So you're a snitch and you're the other thing. So he starts passing it. So it, it gets around, but he nobody ever really kind of like he knows people know, but he doesn't say anything. Well, I we would we you know there was the the cracker box right the the TV room for the white guys right so the cracker box yeah that's called it. that's called it. <laughs> um we you know there were so many blacks there like the blacks had the big room right right they had the big 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 TV of course. big TV room of and then course. you had you had the Spanish room <laughs> which was the size yeah. the same size as the cracker box cracker box same cracker. Okay. yeah well the Spanish also had one TV in the big room like right. there's like eight TVs they had one TV there because they were a little bit larger than the white guys so we're in the uh, I'm in the white TV room and this guy we would watch TV and stuff and he would you know people start talking you're watching whatever fishing shows and stuff that I couldn't stand right like you're watching you know deadliest catch and it's like <laughs> oh god so you're sitting there and people they talk and stuff and he was somebody guy came and said yeah man I just got my halfway house I'm leaving in two months oh man that's good good for you bro good for you guys yeah and then this guy's name was Billy and Billy would suddenly say something like um yeah I don't know where I, I don't even think I'm gonna take halfway house well back then with his charge you couldn't take halfway no, you couldn't house get halfway in, house. in Florida you can now but you couldn't wow. then so he goes and and I was like he's like yeah I'm not sure where I'm gonna go when I get out I go well, I I know where you're not gonna go and he goes. <laughs> and he looked at me and go, where? I go, anywhere near a church, a daycare, or an elementary school. Fuck you, Cox. Fuck you. And he <laughs> everybody would laugh, and he'd be like, you're a piece of shit. Fuck you. And I'd be like, ha, ha. Yeah, but I get to live where I want. You know, and he says, but this is a big guy, too. He's six foot tall, you know, but we also kind of just always joked around. Right. And I would always joke around about stuff that he didn't, people didn't think was funny. So one time we're sitting there watching TV and he was a, just a weird, you know, the guys are weird. So he's gonna, what he's going to say, you're probably not going to think, ah, that's not too weird because right. they say weird things. So you're watching TV, but anybody watching this is going to be like, that's a weird thing to say. So you're watching TV and there was a chick walking down the beach and he goes, he's behind me and he goes, well, you wouldn't know what to do with that, would you, Cox? And I go, shit, I got a better chance of hitting that than you do. And he, and he goes, he said, hell, I want to fuck something. He said, I'll knock your ass out and fuck you. Like that, and I go, shoot, I said, I'm a little bit young for you. I said, plus I have my GED. All right, I go, plus I have my high school diploma. And he, he just gets up and bam, just, I like to put my hand like he punched me, but he didn't, he bitch slapped me. So he bam, and I mean, <laughs> knocked me out of my chair. I almost fucking hit the ground, it was so hard. Right. So I'm stumbling, I turn around. I At first, you know what I thought happened? I thought someone had walked, you know you walked around with your chair on your head? Yeah. I thought somebody had walked in the room, and he and because somebody had kind of the door, had somebody had opened the door. And I thought someone dropped the chair on me. Right. So I jump up at first like, damn. And then I realized he hit me. I, and he's standing there. I was like. I hate that realization. Like, wait Oh, a like, like, damn, I got to do something now. <laughs> I just want to go in my cell, curl up in a ball and cry. <laughs> There's four other guys in this room. That's right. So I go, motherfucker. He's like, fuck you, fuck you. Piece of shit. And then he turns around and walks off. Thank God. Because <laughs> Billy would have beat the brakes off me. I right. put up a fight. But I'd off was probably once he got me on the ground. Oh, I started squeal. I just started ahead, squealing like a child, like a small stuck pig. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Help! Fire! Go ahead. Fire! fire. <laughs> oh, so, um, but he gets up and I sit back down. I go, what fucking piece of shit? Like literally, this is what's so funny. Is people don't realize, like, in prison, something happens like that, it immediately goes back to normal. Like we didn't sit around talking about it and, and hug and how are you feeling okay and do you yeah, want to talk. It's, you it's, immediately. I sat back down. That's an everyday occurrence. Right. Yes. Boom. 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 Fuck you guys. Walks off. I sit down. I start watching TV. Like it's that's that happens all the time. You see a fight right there. Bam. 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 bam, bam. You get broken up. You're like oh, that's crazy. Yeah. So what happened with so and so? Yeah. Um. So what what happens? I start watching TV and my buddy goes, "Yo, bro, you okay?" And I go, "Huh? No, I'm fine." He goes, "No, you're not." He's need to go look in the mirror. What? I walk in there, 
half my eye is bloodshot red. Half. The whole white of my eye. Whoa. And I thought, no. And I realized that you still can see Billy's face. handprint <laughs> on my face. You can see like two of his like two of his fingers, fingers right. <laughs> I'm like So I know I might bruise, right? Right. Might. Yeah. <laughs> I well, know I might bruise. I, I made it through count. Through right. four o'clock count. Right. Oh, I made it through eleven o'clock count and four o'clock count. And then they call me in the all of a sudden after right after four o'clock. You see the two two guys from like SIS walk in, and then we're all standing in our room in our cells, still standing there waiting. And all of a sudden they go, um, who's Billy's last name? Whatever, you know, Billy, you know, wait, Cox and Baker to the front uh, front office. Damn. <laughs> of course. So uh, we walk in the front office. I walk in. I stand there, and I, I'm, I walk in. I'm, I'm like, "Yeah, what's up?" And he goes, "No, no, no. Turn your head." <laughs> He's like, "Oh yeah, yeah." He was like, "I got." He was Cox. I already know what happened. He's like, "I got, I got four cop outs already." So there was only four. Wow. People. There was only three or four people in the room. Oh, somebody that wasn't in there. Like, really? Yeah, yeah I'm they, getting in on he this. He heard snippet. it. Yeah, <laughs> and put in a cop. So, so that means four people put in cop outs. Were notes to the, saying, "Hey, there was a fight. Cox was involved, and so was Baker." So Baker, he comes and he's like, "What's up?" And they're like, "Hey, they're like, so um, they go, so y'all got into a fight." And he goes, "I don't know what you're talking about." And he looks at me and they go, "You got into a fight, Cox?" He goes, "I mean, I, I can see you got into a fight." He goes, "And I've got the cop outs right here." I said, "No, it wasn't a fight. There was no fight." And he goes, "I can see that you were in a fight." I said, "No, no, a fight insinuates that there were two people at odds." I said, "I was assaulted." And I said, wow. and the guy, and he looks at me, he goes, damn, Cox. I go, fuck you. Like that. <laughs> and because I already know we're going to the shoe. They're not putting us in the same cell in the shoe. Right. And if, and if you think that I'm going to, what I'm going to, you bitch slap me from fucking behind. You right. think I'm going to be like, no, no, I'm going to hold my water. I'm going to, we're on the same team. <laughs> fuck you. You hit me. So we go to the shoe. He goes to the medium. The last cell in the medium, they're redoing our shoe in the yes. low. So the only place available is the shoe in the pen. So they bring me to the <laughs> pen. Do you have any fucking idea what these guys in the pen look like? You walk in, their entire faces are tattooed. tattooed. Yep. They're, and Which they're is unbelievable around. to me. I'm like, what in the... You're not getting a job at the bank when you get out, bro. But then you realize, oh, you're not getting out. Yeah. Oh. So that's okay. That's war paint. Yeah. So they have little tears because they're yes. crying inside. Yeah. Um, they're, oh, you, you have tears. Oh, other people's losses. You're oh, a, go ahead. You're a sad clown. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, bro. They've got them in, in the pen there. They got them in cages in the pen walking around like cage. Like, and I mean small little cages. Yes. It's not like in the low. It's one big. The outside wreck for the, low, or for the, the shoe is a big, big room. No, that room in the pen is broken up into tiny little five foot by Section five foot off. Yep. cages because you can't put two guys in the same one. And they're walking around like a like a caged dog, like just back and forth doing push ups. Yeah, and you're going. I mean, when I walked in, like I'm all handcuffed up, and I look at the the CEO bringing me, in, and I go, "Yo, bro, you cannot put me in a fucking in, in a cell with one of these guys." He goes, <laughs> "He's no cox. He's don't worry. He said, we're not putting you in a cell with him. We got a cell for you." It's fine. I understand. He's laughing about it. I said, this ain't good, bro. I said, there's no no landscaping here when we pulled in. Like, if there's landscaping at the low, there's... Yeah, they have palm trees. Yeah, like, there's no landscaping. Just to sit under the trees and let them relax. I'm not designed for this. I didn't stab anybody. Like, I... So he... So they're like, you know, they put me in the cell. Immediately. It, it was amazing how polite the COs were at the pen. Yes. Uh, all right, Cox, look, I hold on, hold on, right? Okay, I got you some books. Okay, so you can read. I got you this. Here's your cleaning supplies. Here's this. Here's that. If you need anything, don't hit the bell, okay? Do me a favor. Just kind of wave us down, okay? Just kind of, you know, knock on the window. We'll come because we come around a, a lot, a lot. Um, also, I got you. I mean, if you need anything, if you're cold because it gets cold in here, just knock on the door. Let me know. I'll get you another I mean, like the guards at the low talk to you like you're a piece of garbage. Yes. Cuz they can get away with it, but at yes. the pen, they could get hurt. Yes. So they could get super, attacked. Right. So I was there for 24 hours. Literally like the next day, they came and they got me. They said, "Yeah, yeah, we're we're releasing you." Like I'm out in a day for a fight. What happened to Billy? Oh, Billy never got out. Billy was 6 months away from being released anyway. I almost think that it was part of Billy's plan was to get into a, some kind of an altercation 
and not and and do six months in the shoe. So it looks like he went to the halfway house or just disappeared. Or you know you know he you know guys will you know how guys will run up a debt. Yeah. And they'll be like, yeah, I'm getting released in six months, and they'll run up a debt when really they're leaving in like a week, and they'll run up like a three hundred dollar debt to a bunch of guys, and then just boom, go to the halfway house and disappear. Wow. Um. Oh yeah, yeah. So, listen, I got anyway. Um. Th- the point is, is that yeah. So I did. So when I talk, I don't say this, but I could say, when people say, "Where'd you do your time?" I could say, "I did some time in the pen, I did some time in the medium, and I did some time in the low." I don't, but I've always thought I could do that. You could. Do you remember the article about the pen that was in in uh, Tampa Ta- Tampa Tribune? They talk about the riot in the pen, and they talk about the the Coleman Prison Compound, and they say Matt Cox and Conrad Black yes. were in the compound, and they make it sound like I was in. They make it sound like I was in, in the, the the area. Yeah, yeah, in, in the area in, where in the, the riot was. Faci- they right. called it the same facility. That or, or the same complex, they they group the whole complex that holds. Matt yeah, Cox. it was like there was a riot in the complex. We're not sure, and this complex holds people like Conrad Black and Matt uh, Matthew Cox. Cox. We're not sure which area they were in at the time of the riot. So <laughs> it was like I was in a riot. Like it looks like when people read that, like, look Cox, it looks like you were in a riot with stabbings and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, when like, really I was in my cell napping. It's like if you yeah, if you could have known the art, yeah, I was the arguments that were going on at yeah. the at the low over the I was, chess I was, game. I was looking out the window as they were landing <laughs> helicopters. You could hear shotguns going off. I'm like, glad I'm not over there. <laughs> Those guys got it bad. <laughs> so, all right. So, I'm sorry. Sorry. Back to our dap. Back to our dap. All right. <clears throat> I forgot where we were. Um, we were. We were at. Oh, okay. So listen. Wait. I got to tell one more thing. This is. So you have to. So the the environment inside of our dap with that 120 guys. Part of the whole thing is this. I'm just is just. I'm just. I know you know this. Right. So part of that is that. A, a big part of RDAP is holding your peers accountable. Is that yes. how they said it in yes. yours? Yes. Because our two programs have a little bit different of uh, you know the the things the the labels they gave things are a little different. Um, and so you would one of the big things was like they, the staff couldn't couldn't monitor you all the time. So a big thing was like you had to monitor your peers. So if you saw that if I saw that Zach was doing things that were wrong or inappropriate, it's my job to say, hey, bro. Your uniform's not really ironed, and Doctor Smith, or it, it's appropriate to be ironed. Well, you you know, remember you signed an agreement to obey all the rules of our of the institution and of RDAP yes. at all times. Right. So yes, when you're holding them accountable, you're like basically saying you signed that paper, saying you were going to follow the rules, and you ain't doing that. But yeah, right. you're right. <laughs> and it, it it would get so bad. So some of the guys are like, "Hey, bro, you're you're smoking Tucci." I know you were smoking Tucci in the in the bathroom, and it, so someone was like, "Hey, you're smoking drugs in the bathroom at night. Like, you don't don't make me be in a position to pull you up. Stop it. If I catch you again, and that they would they would say that. Oh no, it was, it was, but listen, it would get so petty. I know this didn't happen in the pen, so it was so no no this part. It was so petty. Literally, I'm brushing my teeth, and I would you know I turn on the water and brush my teeth, Shh, brush my teeth, and some guy, and then I. He standing there, some guy. Boom! I turn it off. I spit. You know, okay, I'm all done. Go to turn around. He's like, "Hey, Cox, you got a minute?" Because that's how they would start. You got a minute? And I go, uh, "And this is what they call a confront and level." And I go, "Yeah, what's up?" And he goes, "Um, I noticed when you were brushing your teeth, you left the water on. You know, that's not good for the environment. It's not good for for just for society in general. We need to conserve water. And so I'm just letting you know that in our app." Part of the rules are they want us to shut off the water. So I just, I'm just bringing that to your attention. And I go, now you're supposed to say, you know, I appreciate you telling me. And then you repeat what they said. There's a whole little process you're supposed to go through. And like literally the guy that told me that, like the second day I was there, this is a guy that used to, he, he was a crack baby. He used to rub, take his finger and rub it in his belly button. Oof. Right? And then he would smell it. Ugh. He would also constantly nibbling on his... He would walk around rubbing his belly and pu- and pulling on his teeth. And he was... He would pick in his ears. Like, he was a real... But he straightened up in RDAP. Like, we'd give him a hard time in the unit, but he was a whole go fuck yourself. But in RDAP, he straightened up. So, so I'm looking at this guy. He'd been there three, four months before me. 
And I'm looking at this guy thinking, did a crackhead, a crack baby crackhead, just tell me how to live my life? Like, are you serious? Like, bro, you eat with your hands. I've seen you chewing on your toenails. Like, you're a disgusting human being. And I, I was, and I had to turn to him. I be, I was like, <laughs> um, yeah, all right, uh, yeah, good talk, bro, good talk. Like, I just got in there. I don't know anything, so I leave. Um, but that was the kind of thing. Like, you would, you would type, you'd be typing, and then you'd get up to leave, and somebody would say. Uh, by the way, bro, um, I noticed that you didn't go to the bathroom and wash your hands before you were typing on the computer. And, you know, we all use those computers. So it's important that we keep each other clean. It's a clean environment. We want to, and but, you're like, what? The? Yeah, well, they, um, they, they got on me for um, the ice machine had broken down. And so there was no ice. Well, there was a little bit of ice on the bottom and they had taken the scoop, I guess the guard, it's like, hey, the ice machine's not working. They took the scoop. So I took my cup, the ice that was left, and scraped it out of the back, out of the bottom corner. And I actually got a uh, help up for that. Help so. up. So, so yeah, so that's the point is that, so somebody comes to you and they say, hey, stop. Like, hey, I noticed that you did this. Like, typically the, the proper protocol is to go to that person and say, hey, I noticed this is what's happening. You confront them, confront and level. You confront that person. They then, if they're receptive and they go, you know what, man, I appreciate you telling me that. I didn't realize that you're right. You're absolutely right. That was wrong. And, and if they feel okay with that, like, yeah, he, he, he was good with it. Then that's it. It ends. But if you didn't do that, or if he felt like you weren't receptive, then the next day or within a week or so he could in the morning meeting, they get to a point in the morning meeting where they say, are there any pull-ups or help ups help up and people would raise their hand. So, and so you stand up and you say, excuse me, Isaac Allen, Mr. Allen. And then you'd stand up and we would be facing each other. Right. And it'd say, they'd say, well, what's it about? They said, well, and then there was a protocol. I forget exactly what it was. But they basically say, Hey, two days ago I was in the ice room. The guard had taken the scoop. The ice machine was broken. I noticed that you went, you leaned it in the thing. You scooped up the last bit of ice with your cup. One, obviously, it's disgusting for you to take a cup that you use and put it in the ice. That's inappropriate. But two, you took the last bit of ice, which isn't fair to the rest of us. And three, you should have done that either because the guard took the scoop, which is to tell everyone not to use the ice machine. So part of the protocol is, and I'll follow it, and ask you, well, how did that make you feel, Mr. Cox, to see Mr. Allen doing that? <laughs> I, I think well, that well, really because ours was like um, what were the damaging consequences right so the, for us so how would you feel I, I wouldn't I don't well, like, the damaging consequences they would say well and the damaging consequences are it's it's you know you're not and then they would tell you what like thinking errors you, you were struggling struggling with. with you're struggling with whatever you know with you know should thinking and this thinking and that thinking they had to give you like two or three and then they would say the way you need to work on it is yes. and then they would tell you give you, you an assignment to do they give you homework yes you need to go around to a hundred uh, or to 50 of the people in the unit and ask them what you, the appropriate uh, response should have been when you saw that the scoop had been taken and like it was like it was they, they'd give you something to do homework something to fill out um, you need to come in here and do a RSA on the board or do something. They'd ha have you do a skit acting out like what you did and what you learned from it and stuff like that. But what you got to mention, because we really got to give the, the format of how all this lays down. But what you got to mention is when someone else approaches you like that and they stand you up in front of all 120 people in the meeting and tell you what you did wrong, you're not allowed to say one word. No, you can't. You cannot. There are no rebuttals. You cannot put up an argument. You even just if have they to got, repeat what they said. And some of the people lied. Yes. There were ones where there were false pull-ups. They would, they would, something would happen maybe, and they would manufacture something that didn't happen and say that you said things you didn't say just because one, they wanted to pull you up. And, and you, cause, cause, cause not everybody had to do a pull-up. Like they always tell you, you don't have to do a pull-up, but Almost nobody ever graduates that program without doing a pull up. Well, there's so there's so many pull ups required every day. Oh, you mean for the group? For the group, 
that eventually everybody's probably going to have to do one. Yes, everyone needs to be on the receiving end of one. That's like understood. That's what the um third the people in the phase three would tell you. But um, I'm going to ask you today: Did you have to accept the help? Respo- because, oh, yeah. Because yeah. could you accept or deny it? No, no, you had to accept it. Later, you could go back to your DTS because you had an assigned. There's like, say, there's you four or five. Deny it? No, you had to go. You had to accept it. And then you could later go back to your DTS and say, listen, that's not what happened. And you could explain the situation because I've seen them where they flipped them, where they did that. And the next day they pulled the guy up. Like the whole thing came out in the wash. Like they brought him in. They said, look, he's saying this. He said that. And he's got three of his buddies that were there. And that's not what happened. You just twisted what happened. And so that whole thing would occur. And then the next day he pulled you up for manipulation. You manipulated a situation to your advantage or retribution. You're upset with me because two weeks ago, this is what happened. Oh, they had a whole thing. Or you pulled me up retaliation. You pulled me up because you thought I was going to pull you up. So you did it preemptively and <laughs> twisted it. Oh, it oh was, is it twisted? It was good, bro. It was, oh, it was the most stuff. dramatic. Like the the tension would get like it's most of the time people just kind of sitting there fidgeting. You know what I'm saying? Talking to your neighbor, whispering. But whenever the help up came and it got for real oh, the whole group mouth open so where i was people could actually refuse to help up oh like no. you could stand up and i'd say hey i'm helping you up because i saw that such 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 and then the facilitator would ask mr cox do you accept the help up what, what? and okay, you could right. say no i do not accept the help up you can give a rebuttal you have to tell them why you didn't accept it and then you sit back down Sometimes the DTS got involved. And I have a couple of stories about that. I was, I was just, just going to say, like, what kind of pull-ups did you get? Like Me? We got, we, no, not you, just in oh. that program. Like, our pull-ups were like someone oh. snuck – you snuck some chicken out of the out of the chow hall. <laughs> or you used – we used to not be able to use, um, like, seasoning. Like, you couldn't bring seasoning in to the chow hall. Like, you yeah. could only use what was provided yeah. to you. In the chow hall. Like, so there was all these little, like, I noticed that you, I was there the other day. I saw you pull something out and use salt <laughs> on your food. You're not supposed to take it. You know, you're in. not supposed to do that. You're, you're suffering from, or your entitlement. Entitlement. Oh, entitlement. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, same thing, skipping the line, you know what I'm saying? Or leaving early, uh, leaving something early or not finishing homework so we had a lot of um pre-scheduled pre um determined help ups like we had to have at least two every day so a lot of times people would get together and say hey matt let me you know say we're gonna need some help ups so we actually facilitated it just to keep the bs down we'd help people up you know give us and every once in a while the dts would get upset because you're like oh these are all bs help ups and, and then they give them assignments. Sometimes you would get an assign, like they'd already have guys that look. I'm gonna stand up. So and so is gonna stand up. So and so, and they're gonna yes, give you assignments. Yes. And your assignment's gonna be bullshit, bro. Yeah, I'm not yeah, gonna make yeah, you do it. Yeah, the the phase three. But every so often there was a legitimate issue, and a person would have the balls to stand up and give a help up on that issue. And those were the moments where everyone's like, <gasps> you couldn't believe it because the reaction was real. The the situation was gr- real, and there's what? real. Con- this is what's fucked up. There's real. Con- this is a year, uh, possibly two years, like you said, a year and a halfway house. Let's say it's eight. Let's say it's six months in the halfway house. It's still eighteen years of prison are at stake. Yes. So when people think, oh, that's just silliness. No, this is eighteen months where you can get back to your wife or your kids yes. or your family members or re- like. 18 months is not a joke. Contingent upon your response right. to someone telling you you didn't do anything. Yeah, you Or telling you something you did Telling do you that it. you didn't iron your clothes yes. today. So because I might snap at you for because I didn't shut off the water or because I snuck some chicken out of the chow hall because I'm starving to death. Um, I might be, if I don't accept that in the proper way and say the right things, I might get kicked out of the program or pushed back in the program because they would – Hold people back. Yes. You know, and at I your might, reaction. Right, right. Just, yeah, based on nothing. Like, like Mr. Cox, um, I'm seeing a lot of bad body language. Bad body. <laughs> and you could just because, like, you're, so the guy starts talking, and you're like, well, that's like, when being black is a privilege because we don't, we don't turn red. I cannot tell you how many white guys I turn see red and just, turn pink and like eyes, bloodshot, like, <laughs> 
Can you repeat what he just said? So what now, were some, they can't what were even some hear them? him. They're like, yeah, he says something about, uh, you know, like. Oh, so you many. get furious. You, you get like, I'd see guys who get, most of the guys would get like that deer in the headlight look and they get scared. Like right. I got pulled up once or twice and it was fury. I mean, I was just like this motherfucker. Like he's because he's he blatantly is lying about this. Like it's what happened is not what he's saying happened right now. And I was, and so they actually stopped the pull up. Cause I, the second time I went through the program, I was never pulled up the first time. Right. I don't think I'd have to check the book. Um, Cause I literally, you remember how they gave you like a, a, a date. Well, you only, what did you do the first time anyway? Like um, a month? Six months. The first time you went six months? I was six months one time and like eight months to, or seven months the next time. I, I was into phase three. And the, the second time when I quit, the first one, I got right at phase three and they told me, hey, management variables on you. You can't be moved from the institution. I was like, oh, I'm out. <laughs> I'm glad this place. <laughs> um, so, but, but what I'm saying is the second time, like I really got preferential treatment for some reason because I was extremely honest where most people were wanted the year off and I didn't, by the time I it was available to me. I didn't quite, I never really, I kind of explain it in the book where if I passed the program and got the year off, I literally would only get a few months of halfway house. And I was more concerned. I would rather do a little, a couple more months in halfway in prison than get a year off my sentence and only get two months of halfway house. Cause right. I needed as much halfway house as possible. Cause I just didn't have any money. Right. And my fear was I'm going to get out. There's nobody to give me money and I'm going to, I'm going to need, six or seven months in the halfway house. Like I never put in for home detention to try and get on an ankle monitor. Like, no, I want to, I want to stay in the halfway house. I'm saving as much money as possible so that I can rent a room, get a fucking, get a, you know, get a, get a job, get enough money to rent, a, to rent an apartment or a room and buy a, buy a vehicle. Cause you get out with nothing. Right. So you You're give right. me two, two, if they had given me a month halfway house or two months halfway house, I can't save that much money to, to do anything in that, in that time. Right. I'm going to be on the street. Right. So I needed that. So, but going in the program kept me at Coleman because if you were in a program, they put a management variable on you and they Which. allow you to not be switched. And I wanted to stay at Coleman because one, I was writing multiple guys stories, but two, my mother was only an hour away. Right. And if they moved me, she was going to have to drive at a minimum of four hours to see me. And that's if I went to Miami, right. any place else we're talking about six or seven hours. Right. You know, so I wanted to stay, but so I, but because of that, I was able to be very honest about everything and everybody and exactly how I felt. And so there was just no filter. So I ended up getting kind of prefer preferential treatment because one, I'm well-spoken. Um, I was very honest and I had no filter. So you, we would be in our, let's say our, our class and there's 30 guys in the class and people would talk and then the, the DTS would respond and then she would like, we're talking about a good 20% of the time. She'd go, well, Mr. Cox, what do you think? And I was like, honestly, I don't know what he said. And I just blast the guy. Or I'd say, I think this is exactly, I think he's being honest. I think that that's what happened, you know? So I ended up having a good treatment there. So the one time I got, sorry, the one time I got pulled up, well, I got I a couple times, but one time I got pulled up halfway through, the guy was just lying. And you could, my body language was so fucked up. And I was so angry and I was so ready to light. So I guess he blindsided you. That's... I kind of knew it was going to happen because there had been an incident, but right. I wasn't going to pull him up or anything. Like I didn't care. We got into a little, little tiff, little argument where I never even said anything. He just, he was like bipolar or something. He just went nuts and started yelling at me in the line. And then, so the next day he pulled me up. So, because that night he tried to confront and level me about it. And when he went, he goes, Hey Cox, you got a second? I just went, I walked right by him. I go, no. And then a little 20 minutes later, he stopped me and he goes, hey, Cox, man, I'm, I, he stopped, stepped in front of me. I was standing somewhere. He stepped in front of me. He goes, hey, man, sorry about today. He put his hands out and I go, Psst, that ain't happening. And I walked off. So he was pulling me up to say, hey, you're holding resentment. You're this or that. But then he twisted the situation. So in the middle of him twisting it, making me look like I had said something, even though I never even said anything to the guy, he just went off on me because I had glanced back and looked at him because he was talking loud. I just looked back. He's like, what the fuck are you looking at? Huh? And then so he mouthed off to me. And then his buddy mouthed off to him. They're both mouthing off to me. And I just started laughing. I was, I go, I was thinking, I was thinking to myself, are you nuts? You're an art at with me. 
<laughs> like, look how you're behaving. Like, I'll pull you up tomorrow. You know, it, so, but I just started laughing. And then I just turned around and a couple of his buddies were like, hey, 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 they pulled him back and it was over. But he then tried to apologize. He then twisted the pull up. So in the middle of the pull up, I get, I'm sitting there just looking at him like, I'm about to cut you in half. I'm going to cut this dude's head clean off. Like, I was going to lean into him. And so what happened, even though you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to. I had already told the DTS, if anybody ever pulls me up and they're being dishonest, I'm not accepting responsibility. Oh, Mr. Cox, you have to respect. I don't care. I said, I'm going to cut that dude's head clean off his fucking body in front of everybody. And I don't care what the consequences are. And so she could tell, like, there's like three DTSs and they're sitting there going back. He's going on and on. And and I start going, like, you could see my body language and somebody even says, hey, hey, Cox, body language. I go, fuck that. (laughs) <laughs> like that. And the guy was like, oh, you know, they're scared. Like everybody, they're like, Whoa. they don't say anything. They're like body language. And I'm like, fuck that. And I'm like, like I'm waiting for him to finish so I can lose it on him. So you didn't hear a word he said. I, I, I heard he was lying. And so the DTS ends up saying Dr. Smith happens to walk in. She goes, you know what? The DTS stops it. She just stop. Hold on a second. Goes and get the, gets the doctor. Doctor comes in, walks in and says, um, what happened? Okay. And she looks and she goes, What's the pull up? He starts talking and then halfway through she goes, she goes, stop. Cox, what happened? And she, and, and you know, of course people are like, holy shit. Like that never happens. And I said, here's what happened. Boom, 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 boom. I said, then this happened. Then this happened. I said, and he asked me to shake his hand. And I said, no, I said, he asked me this. I said, I said, that ain't never going to fucking happen. I just kept walking. And she goes, why did you do that? I said, because he's a piece of garbage. I said, and I am holding resentment. I said, that's why. And she went, okay, well, I don't, I don't see that there's an issue here. She goes, Cox has every right to be upset. Like everything you learn in the program, she lost, she threw, goes, threw it out the threw window. Threw it out the window. God, I've seen that. Yeah. And, and everybody, and when I walked out, guys are like, are you, are you banging this broad? Like what's <laughs> yes. happening when she calls you in the fucking, in her office, what's happening here? Cause that's. That's unheard of. Right. But yeah, so that's the time that that time I got pulled up. That was like, like insane. But I'm sorry. Finish. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what you were saying. Oh, um, I, what I was going to comment on that and say that we had two guys in our program that the DTS loved and they allowed them to get away and do things that no one else could get away with. Brutal honesty. I was going to ask you, have you seen anyone get kicked out for being brutally honest? I've seen three people get kicked out for brutal honesty. Okay, here's it depends. So yes and no. Yes. The problem is the brutal honesty was the guy when they said, "How do you feel about your?" He, the first time he had like a team. That's a team was when they called. I know it's this is completely silly. Um, to Colby's looking like, is this really a thing? So they would every once in a while they'd get they team you. They would team several people sometimes. They'd, they'd say, hey, we're going to have team on Friday. And then they would team, like, let's say 30 people. Right. And so you would go into your team and you would bring, you could bring, like, a representative. You could bring, like, a a peer. And you could bring, like, your big brother, right? So you could bring, like, three or four people with you to kind of, like, as your advocates. So they would, but if you, something happened, they would have an emergency team. You ever hear yes. Them? And so, right. So what happens is uh, they, so I had a guy one time, they had a regular team. He, in the first phase, he had gone through team. Everybody goes through one or two teams in the first phase. So he'd gone in and they asked him about his victims. And the very first thing he said, well, I mean, my crime was Medicare. So the victims would be the United, it'd be the United States government. And they'd say, well, how do you feel about that? He'd go, I don't feel anything about it. Like, what do you mean? And they were like, do you feel bad? He's like, for the United States government, they go, well, your victims are anybody on Medicare. It's everybody. It's thousands of people. He'd go, eh, I don't see it like that. He'd say, it was the United States government. It was four and a half million dollars. You know, he's like, I mean, I don't know. What, what am I supposed to say? Like, I paid back some of the money. You know, I, wow. you know, he's like, I, I have a nice house. I have nice vehicles. I worked out an agreement. He said, my wife's living well. He's like, we, I did made a lot of money. He's like, do I feel bad about it? No. This is what he's, first phase though. Keep in mind, first phase you could do that because you don't know anything yet. Right. You're a newbie. It was the third phase, and they brought it up again. And his brutal honesty was, to be honest, I just don't feel like I have any victims. 
Like, I don't. I don't feel like I have any victims, so I don't feel bad about it. I know what I did was wrong, and I shouldn't have done it. I certainly wouldn't have done it again. He goes, but do I feel bad for my victims? He goes, no. What victims? You're saying, oh, everybody in Medicare. He's like, I mean, think about it. That's like, what, a point oh 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 two. You know, for everybody in Medicare, like, no, I don't feel bad. Nobody in Medicare knows that I they were hit in some way or victimized. He's like, no. Bam. Straight out the door. You have it. But that was brutal honesty. Right. Stupid <clears throat> brutal honesty. But brutal honesty. Think about it. That was, it was honest. It was being honest. So why do you say it was stupid brutal honesty? Because it got him kicked out of the program. Because the truth <laughs> is. Well, you don't. How did you know what brutal honesty gets you kicked out of the program and which one doesn't? Because brutal, I, I th- well, the one where you're brutally honest about ha- basically what he was saying is I haven't learned anything. And I'm not, he was honest, but the truth is he should have been, if, even if he felt that way, which I'm sure he did, he should have not been honest in that in that situation. He should have lied in that and pretended to say, no, what I did was wrong and I know this and I know that I victimized people by doing that. And I, they, because it's the appropriate thing to say and it's what they want. And the truth is, is like, if you end up stealing a, $5,000 from Bank of America, your victim is Bank of America. There are idiots out there that will scream, you, every single person, that it's not even measurable. What I did to Bank of America isn't even measurable. So did I, are there victims at Bank of America? No, it's just Bank of America. So I think what he said was correct. I think they have an improper uh, interpretation of what a victim, what what your crime is. They don't understand it. And as a result of that, they kicked him out of the program. So he should have known that. He should have simply lied. Yes, I know I have victims. I know this. I know that. He should have really. And his brutal honesty got him kicked out. Some brutal honesty is brutal honesty where you say something like, um, like, for instance, I was. Do you remember the thing you do when you first go in? You have to take like a survey. Not a yeah. survey. It's, it's a series. What well, is a survey? It's a bunch of questions they ask you. And. One of the things they asked me was, um, the guy goes, and I, it was, in a way, I almost just threw him a bone. You know what I'm gonna say, right? He, um, if you read, you read the book, so you know. So I threw him a bone because I actually was, I had done the tat, the little survey, and I said, um, he goes, uh, what are you hoping to get out of this program? And I went, I would like to be able to tone down my narcissism a little bit. <laughs> and he and, and that let's face it, saying that about yourself is it's brutally honest. Am I a narcissist? Yeah, every everybody's a narcissist. Everybody has some narcissistic traits, right? That, that okay, so that's not brutal on when does a true narcissist say I want to tone down myself? What no <laughs> right. Well I'm not saying I'm not saying a true narcissist. I'm just saying narc- my narcissism. I, and there's a scale, right? Like you have the top scale, right, which is, you know, let's face it, like probably Trump. Right? He doesn't think he ever does anything wrong to and I by the way between you and I, I know you'll be disgusted by this. Like I, I actually, there's a lot of stuff about Trump. I do like my problem is he's such a narcissist. And by the way, that's bad for the algorithm. <laughs> um, he, he, the only prop, my problem is not being able to admit when you're wrong. There are things that you've said that are wrong. Admit it. Also, um, you know, it, so there, are, there are some things that I think he's done and said that I wish he was it's like when he goes off prompt, when he's reading the, the teleprompter and he goes off, it's like, Oh God, don't go off script. Well, some of it is fantastic. So, but okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So, so I'm saying that's the top scale. Right. I'm saying me, I'm not top scale narcissist, but I have some narcissistic traits. And so I tell the guy, I say, I'd like to tone down the narcissism. I said, at least to the point where I can actually care about other people and, and at least pay attention to what they're saying when they're talking. And he goes, well, what's happening when they're talking right now? I said, right now when other people are talking and he goes, yeah. And I said, I'm just waiting for an opportunity to talk about myself. <laughs> and the, listen, that is brutal honesty. So is so is what the other yeah, but guy, that got him kicked out. <laughs> so how do you decipher what's going to get you kicked out and what's not going to get you kicked out? I think he should have known better. So I'll give you an example of a brutal honesty that should have gotten someone kicked out, but didn't. But didn't. Okay. All right. Um, if someone says. Um, I've been smoking or I've been using drugs since I've been in the program. In what phase? Two and three. Really? Yes. Here's <laughs> brutal honesty. I think that gets you kicked out was a did guy. Did he get pulled up or did he just admit it? Um, he admitted it. He he stood up okay. himself. He pulled himself up. Okay. Wait a second. Now, 
I think that's different than being caught. This is a guy who basically, that's a, that's a cry for help. I could see him getting, not kicked out, but maybe being held back one phase. Because there's three phases, right? Being held back one phase. I could see that. But maybe not being kicked out. What do you think? What happened? Um, well, uh, <laughs> oh, I, I, I happen to know he did it so he could continue to to smoke. It was kind of like. Oh, like I'm struggling with it. Yes. Nice. The the <laughs> amount of mental manipulation that these guys. Oh, undergo. that's what I thought to myself. And one guy that got kicked out. This is a brutal honest. I think get get you kicked out. One of the DTS was saying that when normally she's like, okay, I'll take care of that for you. And you know, when I say I'm going to take care of something, I take care of it. And he goes, no, you don't. Here's four examples of when you told me stuff and you didn't take care of it. And he pop, 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 pop. It's like immediately she says, leave. You're, you're excused from the meeting and kicked him out. <laughs> what do you think about that brutal honesty? That was just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> like the problem with the DTS is, is that they're first of all they're all emotionally damaged. Like all of them have we had major three problems. females. Yeah, no, we had all. We only had one male. We had like five females, one male, and they were all insane. Yes. The it's funny that the male. The funniest thing about the male uh, DTS was nobody wanted to be there less than him. He wanted to be in that program. <laughs> He less than the inmates. <laughs> he only I I swear I, the only thing I think I ever really heard him say was he would he was he would sit down and he had like the big at the, you know you had the big meeting there was like maybe fifty guys or, or thirty guys they'd have a big circle you had to do it like once a week a process group or something right you'd sit down and people they'd go around slowly he would go in sit down everybody and of course everybody's there on time you know they're all sit boom ready quiet waiting he'd sit down and go. Okay, we left off with Mr. Cox. How are things? Anything you want to talk about? And then you go, well, yeah, you know, I was going to say today that, or, you know, a week ago, this is what happened, but this is what happened. You tell, talk for a little bit. He wouldn't say anything. You'd go halfway around the group or maybe the whole way around the group, right? And then just as things were wrapping up, he'd do this several times during the meeting. <laughs> Ten minutes later. And then at the very end of the meeting, he'd go, well, all right. Uh, I think this is a good place to wrap it up. Like, that's all he ever said. He, this guy, he didn't, per they used to say he was great. His, his guys under him in his class were like, he was amazing. Oh, Why? Yes. He says nothing. He says, he, he doesn't man. hound you. He's not deciphering and giving he's burning critical up, food out. Yeah. He's burning up the clock on his 20-year retirement. Yes. Like, this is the guy who I did like 20 years in the military, got out. And now he's doing this for 20. He's working on his second, his I second believe, government benefit. I believe that um, part of his strain was dealing with those females there okay. because we had, we had, um, so there was another program called Challenge that I started before I went to RDAP and they had two male and one female. And both of the males would like, whenever you'd talk to them about something that the female advice gave you or said they, they they couldn't help but roll their eyes like oh my um okay so that advice is <laughs> so so don't hug someone yeah <laughs> when, when they're spitting in your face and ask them how what's behind this oh yeah it's in so you're right they are they are emotionally damaged and the rdap i we had three female and i felt like they picked the guy that they were probably most attracted to because this one woman um, pick this it's like she loved the thug right you know and, and there was a thug every phase in three there was a thug that she would pick to be mentor so let me let me tell you this about my super being a super dapper i was loved by everybody in the in the um r dap in the unit or the staff the unit okay and despised by one of the st the staff member that loved thug the other two thought I was hilarious because I wrote skits, but the one staff member hated my guts. I could just tell by every exchange, and I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was absolutely hilarious that she hated my guts. Did you, so you didn't even try and win her over? 
No. Okay. No, I used to I used to <laughs> lean into it. I used to lean into it. And and so they picked mentors and they didn't pick me to be a mentor. And there were actually like two groups where they had discussions about that, about why didn't they pick Zach to be a mentor? Right. Like as much as he helps everybody in here, I don't understand it. You definitely think it was her. Oh yeah. 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 I could I like the way my mind works, I could decipher how they, they put it together, but it's it's so it you're right. The staff member are the the DTS are like flawed individuals that sort out us or the people in the group by what they prefer or what they like. So someone liked you, and that's what that's the whole point. That's why they that's why you didn't get kicked out for brutal honesty. Cause I've seen people get kicked out for way less. Like uh, I saw a guy get kicked out for not accepting a help up, right? You know, and he didn't accept it, so they go, "We we kicked him out." So I'm like, going, "Yeah, but we, you know, you're allowed to not accept it, right? exactly." Like, that's that's what we kept going. But aren't you allowed to do that? Yeah, but we can tell that he wasn't progressing. He was in the first phase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, almost never. To get, you'd have to be a complete maniac to get kicked out in the first phase, the first three months. Oh man, you'd have to be a maniac. Well, I, a lot of, in the pen, a lot of people got into fights and oh, well, okay, in well, different situations. So they were they were gone in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. It was hard for them to keep people down there. It was hard. I was just gonna say there was this one. So by the way, so we had one woman who was a Spanish woman. Uh, she was extremely just angry and bitter, and so she was one. She wasn't that hard to deal with, except that. She was angry and bitter. Um, then we had this one woman, a, a black woman, who was a. I don't want to say she was a. I do feel like she was a pathological liar. Right. It, so she had some pathology, right? Some issues with it, because she was constantly saying that she used to tell people that she had a master's degree, right? That Doctor Smith wasn't the only person that had a, a a master's degree or doctorate or whatever she has. Um, uh, she said, and so. She would tell people that that they had offered her to be to run the program, but she didn't want the responsibility. She liked her life the way it was. So, but it come to find out, of course, it was just absolutely wasn't true, right? Right. Like she used words like "educated." Um, you know, so it was just like there were th- there was just like I was like, "Are you serious? Did she just say like we? You know, it's like a couple of guys were like, "Did she just say educated? <laughs> like there was she constantly saying things, and I used to I had a list in the book. I list things that she yes. said. Uh, um. Uh, well, God, what was one of the ones she used to say all the time? Uh, what it was was what it. Uh, I mean, she would say something. It would be like, like it's almost like she was well spoken, but it was like, I feel like you're almost saying this on purpose. But she she wasn't. So we we just it was like he comes out later. I actually asked Doctor Smith. Doctor Smith actually said, I don't know why she tells people that. She's like, no, she doesn't. She is, she, she is, but she tells people that all the time. But she said lots of stuff like, oh, people say, oh, how was your weekend? And she'd go, oh, we flew to New Orleans. Uh, we did this. We did that. We did, And and it wasn't true. Like you didn't fly to New Orleans because uh, two days later somebody would ask you and she'd say she went somewhere else or she went, did this. It was these little pa- – but, you know, you're in prison. You don't know. Right. So she had some issues there. Um, but she actually liked me. At first she hated me. The first first phase she hated me. Second phase she liked me. Um, and then we had one that was, uh, her name was Dr. Neesmith or not, Dr. sorry, sorry, just Neesmith. Her name was Neesmith. Neesmith was bipolar and she hated, she had some people she absolutely loved and some people she absolutely hated and she absolutely loved me. Right. You know, the first very, very first day we got into an argument and I pushed back and I was the only person that I think had ever probably pushed back on her. <laughs> um, and as a result, she backed down and immediately decided she liked me. She was the one that I told you, like, I would fill out my book and hand it to her, and she would look at it. She would hold it for a week, and she's supposed to review them. Oh, yeah. And then a week later, she'd call me in to get my book, and I would think, because I, I either hadn't done the work or I wrote ridiculous things that you should not have. I answered questions completely inappropriately. I mean, wow. like, absolutely inappropriate. Like, not not, like, in a sexual nature, but just in a comical, ridiculous nature. One of them was like, what would your life be like in 10 years if you stopped using drugs and what would your family life be like and what would your political or your your community life be like and i put down wait and what would your relationships be like and my answer was it, you gave you one paragraph and my my answer was hopefully in 10 years from now i will be dating 
a 22 year old ex stripper who is only with me for my vast real estate wealth. I will have no children. I said, no family to speak of. I right. said, and since I'm a currently a convicted fraudster, I am a pariah in the community and therefore will have as little to do with them as possible. That's it. That, that was my answer. I said, I said, and I'll be absolutely happy. And then I put go art at no. Oh, and then I, I put, I, I said, hopefully I'll die at the age of 95 betting my young bride. Like that was Damn. like it was ridiculous, like hilarious, hilarious. But also people would read it and go, oh, bro, you're going to get thrown out. Gave it to her. Two weeks later, she's read all of them, looked them up, graded them, came back in. She goes, okay. And that, that by the way, my, my whole book was riddled with those. There were no, there were no serious answers in the book comes back and she would go, okay, Cox. And I go, I'd walk in waiting for the lecture, waiting for the, what the hell are you doing? You think this is a joke? What are you doing? She comes up, she goes, look, she said, look through your stuff. She said, you clearly have a good grasp of the material. She said, um, just keep up the good work. Like you're doing great. And I was like, thank you. Take my book and I leave. This happened over and over the, the whole program. She never looked at my books. Never. Wow. There were guys that would like barely say something out of line, and she'd make them erase the whole page and rewrite it because you had to write in, in pencil. But I'm saying, so like I really got lucky. Like if I ever took that program again based on like this podcast or this book, if they saw it, I'd be dead. They just never <laughs> let me. I won't make it through phase one. So um, I know a guy that did that who wrote that down and called the DTS – um, what did, what did they say that he wrote something in the book that is is trifling and I don't think that like this is a good idea and and these questions are asked you know to belittle us and stuff like that in his book and he got kicked out for that. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> and you wrote stripper comments and they never said a word. Of course, of course. Who doesn't want to date an ex stripper? Like okay. yeah, you dealt with a. a uh, a lot of different help ups, but the help ups that I had, I, I think I got helped up probably in the the whole time about four times in the group. Where, so you're and, saying someone pulled you up? Someone for pulled something me up. you did, right? So normally where I was, help ups were generally false; they were fake. Really? See, no, man, ours were. I'd say ninety nine percent of them were real, stupid, but real. Well, ours were fake, stupid. Every once in every once in a while, there were real ones. Um, generally, so I was always surprised. I had to ask myself that question. Real help ups. I was always pleasantly surprised at the tension and the resolution. The there were good ones where someone actually had an issue with somebody, and it got very tense where that person was mad and they talked it out and they actually resolved it. I was very happy to see that. You know what I'm saying? And that kind of gave me hope that, you know, there are alternatives to doing it. Well, can I also point out that, like, because in the, you have to think, look, first of all, in the low, they didn't like it. Like, it was upsetting, okay, in general. Because, of course, you're in the low, you're kind of almost pretending uh, that, you know, that you're that you're upset about people snitching and this and that. But the truth is most of the people at the low cooperated right. in some form or fashion. Now, they may have cooperated and justified it, and they may hate snitches, but they're justifying their cooperation. But most of them did. In the pen environment, not only do they despise snitches, but they're ready to retaliate against snitches. Yes. And that's the environment yes. you're in. So you're in an extremely tense Oh man, ours like, is just eighteen months. Or the, you get there, there were so in the meeting. I think you. How many fights did you have? We only what physical fights? Physical in the fights, meet, just one. Okay, in the meeting, physical fights. I've witnessed probably eight. <laughs> and you have to imagine the kind of guys that are in the pen. <laughs> like these like aren't a couple eight, of uh, tax accountants. I, I would say eight <laughs> fights and one assault where somebody lost an eye. So it it well, was. What do you mean fight? So you mean when I say fight, a fight is physical. Yes. Okay. Physical. Okay. You physical. said a, you said an assault. So well, there physical. was one assault and there was eight fights. Well, what's this? What's the difference between a fight and, and an assault? Oh, you mean the guy who just got? Oh, that's right. There's this guy that got just attacked. Yes. He was no fighting back even. It was just an attack. Yes. Okay. So and and then Sorry. there were there were fights where it's it's like you know um like I don't know why this this jackass help me up blah 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 like listen man break it up you know pepper spray everybody <laughs> in your rooms <laughs> my god so 
All right, so for me, I I I had I never had so the point I was trying to make is where I was 90% of the help ups were coordinated. So we we had a help up team where guys would go around and say, "Hey, listen, we got to have two help ups each day." So it's coming around to you. You got to be helped up. So John's going to help you up. He's going to say that uh, maybe you skipped in line or you in a line. You told kind of a, a joke that nobody appreciated. And we're going to help you up for um, telling that joke. Oh, bro. See that 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 right there. That would have never. Fl- These guys in my in my program were snitching so much. You couldn't get a coordinated effort like oh, that. That's, that's no, all no. we did. No. That's all we did. No. So every, we set up. So every day we'd have two set up help ups going. Wow. And every once in a while. That is manipulation. Oh, yes. That's how we did it. It looked good for the ladies. Looked good for the ladies. That's, how, that's, how, that's what it was. You know, and, and the help up was, was, was fake. For, for me, I was kind of an overachiever. So I love joking around in comedy. So my favorite part of the meeting was the upbeat ritual. I hated so, the SP. Oh how embarrassing. It was embarrassing and just. Bro, I came up with, so some of the people I talked to that are in RDAP, they still, they still call me <laughs> and I give them suggestions of upbeat rituals. <laughs> still. And they, some of the upbeat rituals I've done are been solidified. Uh, on the RDAP phone? On the RDAP phone. So did, did they ever listen to your phone calls? Yes. Yeah. I forgot about that. That's well, something else say, we can talk about. We had a guy, by the way, real quick. We had a guy that was working in some chick on the outside. She had sent him like three thousand dollars, and he was he was bragging about it on the phone, and they heard him. And of course, he's also talking about he's calling women, you know, bitches and hoes. Yes. And, yeah, this and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got the yeah, yeah. And he's and and, and then he and he yeah. And I got this one girl, man. She sent me three thousand dollars. I told her I got no money when I get out. So I, she she been saving her money. She sent me three thousand dollars. And he had it on his on his uh his uh um his inmate account. They team him. They play the tape, and they tell him he's got one choice. To one, call these other women, all the women, tell them all about each other, and two, send the three thousand dollars back or keep the three thousand dollars. Go back to your old unit because you're getting kicked out of the program. Do the extra year, and you can spend that money. You can keep living the lifestyle you're living in here. Wow. He had to call all of them and send the money back. It got it went around everywhere like they are listing the phone calls, bro. Yes. Oh, but, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, we kind of had the same similar situation. So, man, that made me lose my train. No, um, no, you, uh, the, the, the guy you said that people call, but you said that you got pulled up. You right. Got, I got helped up. So Helped up. Yeah, helped, pulled up. So I, I got blindsided. So uh, every time, all of mine, none of mine were ever coordinated. Even the ice thing was not. So I got helped up one time because I was doing a game for the upbeat ritual, and I said the word porn. Like I asked about the, anyway, I forgot what the upbeat ritual was. And I, I said the word porn. And so then they helped me up and they said, you know, that's offensive. All of our DTS are women and you use the word porn and that's offensive. And I don't know why you chose to use those type of words. That's the help up I got. And I'm going, um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I accept the pull up. Yeah, they, I accepted it. Yeah. There was, there was one they told me that I What'd prob- you have to do. Um, I had to, most of the time they asked me to do skits because that was my thing. I'd write a little play yeah. and we'd do a so little play. So he's not trying to hurt you. He, was he trying to get you messed oh, up? Oh, yeah. Or, oh, really? Oh, yeah. They helped me up one time because we were putting together something for our group. Yeah, one of our groups were putting together something we had to present. I think every, I think each Tuesday and Thursday we had to do a presentation. They had something that went on right after the meeting where it was like a class right. yeah, for yeah, everybody. Yeah. And so each group had to present each time. And so we were had, we had to do a presentation and we had a couple of people that know what they were doing or I was. Oh, you I had to go around and help facilitate with all the skits. Right. And so I was telling them, look, try this over Which this. Is something you would have done anyway. So. Exactly. And they helped me up because they said I was trying to take a leadership role like you weren't listening that you weren't open to anybody else's ideas oh i said and i want to go are you kidding me i, I want to go what idea did you have that i wasn't listening to yeah mr um i don't have nothing i'll do whatever you ask me to do 
those were those were the type of help ups I got. And what they did for me, they played it off of the woman that didn't like me. They basically like fed into whatever disdain, which made me think that somewhere someone was talking like this guy thinks he's all that. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, they 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 would anybody it's funny because like they wanted you to participate and they wanted you to take a leadership role and they wanted you to help everybody else. And then if you did it, you were manipulative, you were entitled, you were like they they there was a way to manipulate any given situation to attack someone in that yes. program. Yes. But um yeah, I you know, like it, you you have to admit like you you learn so much like you could categorize people like after that nowhere near as good like dr smith you could walk into her office sit down she could talk to you for three or four minutes and she could start telling you about yourself and you would be like oh my god like she would say she goes so one of your family members was an alcoholic was it father mother was probably mother and you'd like um. Uh. And well, you don't think that's just from the paperwork and and the they profile may, of no. Us? They they have the PSI. I mean, I'm sure they have your PSI. I'm sure they read it. But I mean, she could categorize like your personality type, like she, she they like that because they, my, they see a thousand guys like you and me. I, like right. I like to think I'm special, right? But in that program, when they're massively having these people come through and they're seeing the same basic, per- and there are only like so many personality types, right? So they can categorize you, and then they can subcategorize you in there, and what kind of help caused that personality type so she was all of them were all pretty good like these weren't stupid people but they were all disturbed like there was some issues and 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 i'm glad you say that because i i felt like the human side of them is the the part i thought was bad i i thought that their emotions played pull the negative of what was positive like you said they want you to do certain things and I'm kind of like one of them overachievers. So when I did those things, it's kind of like, well, we still don't like you. Right. <laughs> I asked you to do this. You did it. You gave it your all. You were very good at it. And now I'm going to target you and say this about you. But I did what you said. You know, it, yeah, there was no way to win. No, but that's the thing. They were very like Dr. Smith may very well be one of the most manipulative people I've ever met. Ever. We had a Dr. Smith. Did you? Yes. Was it a man? No, this is a woman. Um, kind of an attractive woman with black hair. Straight like black Indian, hair. like see, Indian, half Indian, yes, half, yeah, yeah. The right. same Dr. Smith we Are had. Are you serious? Little, she was probably in, in probably Beaumont, Texas. She must have come from Beaumont and then come to because she had just only been in our program for like maybe a year before I got there. Yes, yeah, she was. Listen, here's the thing about Dr. She Smith. Was, she was super manipulative. Oh my God, it was over the top. But here's the thing about her. First of all, she was it, she in in prison. She was a ten, right? Because she was yeah. Because but she kind of had a little belly and she, she looked, looked dirty. She looked, somebody oh, told no, me I, someone had a perfect example of her. They said she's cute, but it looks like if she kicked her shoes off, her feet would stink. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Listen, that's exactly what he, I'm going. How perceptive. When <laughs> I met when I met her, like I'd seen her. Would you I'd, agree with that though? Um, no, but I I would have before I met her and talked to her. Because when I talk to her, here's what, what her thing was. To me, she's about a six, right? Five or six. When you talk to her, she jumped up to like an eight. Well, she's intelligent, but she didn't look disheveled. I never saw her feet. No, not her feet. <laughs> not disheveled. I mean, like, did her hair look like no, it wasn't? No, she had straight, long black hair. Right, but is it like she kept it up or yeah, she just I thought threw she it looked together fine. in the morning? Oh, I mean, well, she looked fine. She, she was... look, always looked disheveled. No, I'm not, not to me. And she was, listen, but manipulative, like you can't believe. Like, yes. I mean, Maybe just. We're not talking about the same kind of a pot belly, a little bit no of a belly. Pot belly. I don't remember any pot. There's no pot belly. Bro, I just what? told you. Uh, she was, she's a six. Like I said, like on the street, she's a six. In prison, she's a nine, maybe yeah. a 10. Yeah, but, I, I agree. She was attractive. Yeah. Yeah, she was probably 110 pounds. She, she used to be married. Was she divorced? To, divorced from, from a basketball player. Like a guy was like a professional basketball player of not a it big had to time. Be the same one, yeah, Indian she, descent. Yeah, well, Indian black, black and Indian, probably mixed. She was mixed. Mean it could be mean as shit. Oh yeah, she was. She could be brutal. I wonder if it's the same one. It's got to be the same one because she probably Cause she did moved, leave us. She probably moved from Beaumont and went there. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. She was. Uh. She was something else. Something else. When did you take it? This is fourteen fifteen. I took it in. 
I took it in 2000 and um, 2018. She, yeah, she got she probably out there. 15. Really? 15, 16? Like yeah. Probably, yeah, because she got there, like I said, a year or so before I ended up. In the, and I, I went to so, – so definitely, probably 16. She probably got there in 16 because I started the program at first in 17. Went for six months, got out for three or four months, got back in for eight months or wow. seven months, and then got back out. Might have, small, might have been almost eight months. What a small world. Right? What well, a small, it's a BOP. Well, I didn't, I didn't, yeah. I didn't have her long. Um, I had the guy, but I'm telling you, I had no problems except with that one woman. Her name was Pruitt. Her name was Miss Pruitt. That's the only woman I had a problem with. And she did not like me. So, bizarre. <laughs> So it, uh, how long was each program, by the way? I was thinking about something you just said. The, the one chick I told you the first time I went through, she didn't like me. Um, how long I was each her, phase? Three yeah, months. each phase. Sorry, three months. Three so, months each, nine months. Right, right. So it was, it, was, it, was, so it was 12 weeks. So I remember the first time I – the first phase I was in this one chick. I uh, can't believe I can't remember her name. The, uh, the black DTS chick that I told you about. And literally – like she, she, when the first day I got there, she was, she started laughing when she saw me that I was going to be in her group. Like literally like looked at me and she was, ha! she was Cox. And I was like, oh man. And after the end of the week, like I didn't say anything like the first week, I figured I'll just be quiet. Right. right. The, the first week. So I didn't say much, but at the very end of the last week, I was walking out that she was saying goodbye to everybody as we walked out the door and she looked at me and she goes, and she goes, Cox. She goes, how's it going? And I went, and I go, 11 more weeks. And I turn around and she goes, oh, and I just kept on walking. And she was like, huh, huh, huh. Like I made it, I made it. And I go, I got 11 more weeks. I'm out of here from you. But yeah, but she ended up liking me. She ended up really liking me. But yeah, I know what you're saying, bro. They can make your life. Yeah, it, it was rough. It was it, rough. It was, it was, so uh, for me, the overall experience it, it was fun for the camaraderie that I had and the people that I dealt with. And it was, it was fun because I got a chance to show off yeah. some skills and everything. And I, I love that it, type of in the pen. I'm sorry. In, in that invite, right, in the pen, let's face it. Like in prison in general, I hate to say this, but in prison, in, in society, like I'm a, I'm a sharp guy. Right. I'm not the, you know, I'm not Elon Musk or whatever, but I'm a sharp guy in prison. You're a rocket science scientist. Yes. I can only imagine what it would be like to be in the pen. You must have been like the brainiac of brainiacs. Yes. Like, yes. So known very popular on every compound that I've been on. Very, very popular. Yeah. Like I hear you. Uh, uh, hey. uh, <laughs> popular, not not in the way that I was popular, where all the all the guys wanted to know me. <laughs> hey, Cox. Now, in, in, including me. No. No. <laughs> Can right. I buy you? Do you need some tennis shoes? No, <laughs> I don't need any tennis shoes. Thank you. Appreciate it. Come in myself for a minute. I don't think so. <laughs> um, but anyway, hey, let's wrap it up. So right. I'm going to wrap it up. All right. Hey, so if you like the video, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button. Hit the bell so you get notified. Share the video. Like the video. I never tell anybody to like the video. So you got to do like, like the video. Love it. Yeah. It, and leave me a comment. And also... Go to Zach's channel. Zach has a channel. We're going to leave the description or leave the description. We're going to leave the channel link to his YouTube channel in the description. He's already started to put up videos. Subscribe. He's at like 630 subscribers. We got to get him over a thousand, a, a thousand um, subscribers and we have to get him a 4,000 hours of watch time. He's almost at a thousand right now. Watch the videos. We need to get him monetized. I really appreciate you guys watching. Thank you very much. See ya. I didn't learn anything, bro. I, I, I literally, do you understand so that? All this, all this is for the camera because I, I think like, do, do you understand that at one point, so you know, the books, you know, the questions you were answering, you answered, I was answering the questions like ridiculous. Talking about, you know, like it's like, will we, where, where will you be in 10 years if without drugs uh, in, in your life? And I put, you know, and, and it was like, hopefully I'll be married. I'll, I will be married to a gold digging ex stripper who only cares about me for my, my vast uh, wealth. And, you know, and, and then it's like, where you're, it asks about family. Like, I will have no family. 
uh, since since everybody's given up on me, I will, uh, you know, a, a community. I said, I'm a pariah in the community. Fuck them. Like, I mean, I was just like literally like just brutal. And I was like, you know, and, and you know, basically that's where like she and I have an arrangement and I will hopefully die betting her at the age of 95 years old. Like, you know, and, and, and you understand, I, so you have to give that to your, to your, um, like the, the, uh, DTS, right? Right. And they review it like every month or so they call you in for a review. Right. My DTS calls me in. Other people she's calling in, by the way, making them rewrite. You had to write everything in pencil. Rewrite statements. Do this again. Do that again. Oh, yeah. She calls me in and she says this. She says, Mr. Cox, I, I reviewed your book. She said, and I was like, okay. And I thought, fuck. Because when I did it, I didn't think anything of it. She goes like this. She said, I reviewed your, your, your material. And I was like, yes, ma'am. And she, go, and she said, she said, obviously, she said, you have a, a good, you have a very good grasp of the material. She said, you're doing excellent work. Just keep it up. I said, okay. Took the fucking book and walked off. I mean, she didn't read it. Of course she didn't. Why would she read it? I'm well-spoken. She's going to me during the class. She's like, Mr. Cox, what do you think about what he said? Because the, the first two phases, you're just trying to get these, these fucking savages to eat with fucking utensils and say thank you. But me, I'm okay with that. I knew the third phase, they will destroy me. The third phase is when they come for the con men. So we'll talk about so phase phase one is intro, like you call it. Right. What was phase two? Like what was your hardest phase? It had to be phase three. Cause you're pull, like, like What you, do you mean by hardest? Like all of it was easy to me. Jesus. Dude, I, I'm I Listen, was so, they do you so understand was, they brutal in the third phase, like the guys that were sailing first through the first two phases? Like the basically the con men, the fraudsters, the you know what I'm saying? The guy, oh. they were okay. They were okay in the first two phases. By the third one, that's when they came for you. Because at the third one, they want to see improvement. So I I broke it down, and and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna bring it up. What was the um? I'm, I'm just trying to so we can hit each section, and of course you anyway. What what was the it called when they called you in to meet with the team? Team, <laughs> this is great. We should. Be, this should be being recorded. Oh, is it? I was gonna say because, yeah, yeah. Team, go, bro. They're teaming yes. me. They're teaming you. Yes. Will you come with me? <laughs> yeah, you had to have a. Yeah, uh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. You had that uh, back, not backup. What but was yeah. it called? It was called the um, sponsor. Yeah, yeah. It was sponsor. Well, I think they did. Yeah, you you needed a peer and like a sponsor, and then you brought your big brother. Did they call him Big Brothers? Yeah, we had we had the Big Brothers big going brother. on. You, you had a, a family, a brother, a brother tree. My poor big brother. This fucking guy was terrified of me. And you had, what were those guys called that were in charge? Like you had. They, oh. they graduated the program. That mentors, mentors. Mentors. Oh, yeah. You had a mentor. And then you had the, the comps, people that had completed the program that were yes. still there. But they weren't meant. See, they, and where I, all right. So all the stuff we should put on camera. So yeah, we can, he's, we can just, he's recording this. Yeah, I'll put it at the end. Huh? He'll throw this in I'll at the end. At the end oh, of it, yeah. Just uh, <laughs> all right. So we can cover. Is this, um, cool. Okay. Yeah, it's good. All right. Yeah, these so, are. So yeah, good. we can. So we can talk about each. <laughs> each phase, or just. I wanted to do the uh, the ten. The I want to do the 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 the. the uh, you do. You, do you understand? I kept all my art app stuff. Like I don't know where it is. It's upstairs in a box, but I kept the books. I even had the armband. These were the armbands. I took a photo of the armband, armband for the cover and put it. This is sitting on an art app book. That's what these are. These are the different phases. Yes. Low phase one, phase right. two. And this is the book. This was, remember Criminal Lifestyle? That That's yes. the name. That's the book. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the 10 thinking habits. 10 thinking habits. Uh, uh, yeah. The, what did I call them? Didn't I thinking have thinking errors? Thinking errors. Right, right. It was um, uh, uh, blaming. Yeah, um, I can remember the. Um, wasn't one of them like a should should thinking? Yeah, was should, should be this way. It should was, be that way. What was the way. acronym for it? Because I remember H H Hog Crow for the positive attitudes. I just memorized them. All right. So did, do you do you understand? Did they did they ever do random tests yes. for you? Yes. Okay. So, so every. Like everybody was terrified of the random tests and they were, and they were all like, bro, what are you going to do? Like, you don't know any of the material, any of it. 
and they just randomly do the test. And I was yes. like, right, right. And they were like, what are you going to do? I was like, oh, I'm going to fail it. I'm going to fail it. And they were like, well, I was like, yeah, but I mean, you don't have to pass the test to pass that that section of, I said, but I'll, I'll get through it. I'll explain. I was nervous. I was uncomfortable. I, 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 you can ask me any questions. I said, you understand? They think I know all this material because I'm great in class. Right. They've, I said, you know, they've gone through my book. They keep giving me these passing scores in my book. So if I fail the test, I can blame it on dyslexia. I can blame it on whatever. I was like, oh, I'll get through it. They're like, you're such a cocky prick. So at one point there was they were going to randomly screen people, right? Like in the morning meeting and just ask you questions. So my big brother came to me. He goes, Cox, are you ready for this? Like if they call you, like, you know, the, you know what the, the 10 attitude, the 10 uh, attitude errors or error, whatever they are. Thinking, and errors. thinking errors are right. I went, no, no. And he goes, well, what about, and he starts asking me questions. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't have any idea. He's like, yeah, but I, I wrote you, he goes, I, I gave you the flashcards. And I'm like, yeah, I've got them here somewhere. And he was like. <laughs> you're you're wasting good stories, no. Matt. You, well, it's going to be on the end. He'll put this on the end. But the funny thing about that is so we get, so he's like, he's, so he's terrified. If I fail, he's like, you understand if, I, if you fail, he's like, I'm supposed to be helping yes, you. I'm your big brother. He's like, yeah, he's like, I'm supposed to be helping you. I'm like, oh yeah, you dropped the ball, bro. Because he's like, I thought you didn't need help. Like you're, you, you're, 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 you're a smart guy. I'm like, yeah, I know. I figure that'll carry me through. Like. I don't really expect to pass the program. I like the unit. It's clean. Everybody's very polite. It's, you know, it's nice. I like it here. I go to bed at 10 o'clock anyway. I don't sleep during the day. You know, like the, all the things that bother everybody else. I don't do those things. So anyway, he goes, he's like, oh my God, oh my God. So he's freaking out. I go, but you, what, what? he's like, you've got to learn it. You got to tell. He goes and gets the guy that told, that put us together, right? That told him I would be a good, a, a good student or whatever. And he goes, oh my God, he's gonna, this is what's happening. What's they call on him? I'm going to, I'm going to get fail. I'm going to, and he goes, Cox, you got to remember him. You got him. So they give me, he had like 50 cards. <laughs> I memorized them in two days. <laughs> in two days, I memorized every single card. I just oh, all day long. pressure does work. It does because I felt bad. You know, it wasn't for any other reason than I was like, I felt bad for him because he needed the year. And so, he was such a nice guy too. He was. <laughs> that's, that's the part of, so phase three is teaching. When you go in, like, so the first one is the introduction. Right. Like you say they feed you. The second one is when you have to apply it. So right. now you have to start doing stuff. And in the third phase, you actually have to teach the phase oneers. Yeah. So where I was, they made you responsible for a certain group of, so you had some phase one people in your group and some phase two people in your little family tree. Right. You know, so I, I'd be like, all right. I, and I had a person just like you, like, no, I don't know that stuff. I go, are you freaking, Okay. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you're taking this shit too seriously. Yes. <laughs> and you're taking it too unseriously. <laughs> Here's what's funny. Um, so one of the things that happened, I think I talk I talk about this in the book. I very quickly realized, you know how you had to go to like AA, you had to go to like this different groups, therapies, you had to learn how to do a pull up, you had to go through the, the classes, right? You so I real I went to like two classes, you had to go to like ten of them. Ten here, ten there, ten this, and you always had to attend AA. I realized right away if you don't attend the first AA meeting, they never put you on the roster and they never check to see if you continue to go. So I just didn't go. Um, I never went the first time. Uh, the second th thing was those classes that you're supposed to go to. I went the first two times and then I just signed the instructor's name over and over and over and over again. And, and of course, every like my roommate was like, what if they check? What if they double check? You're like, then I'm like, well, first of all, it's signing a random sheet. The fact that they're going to grab mine and go grab every single one. I said, somebody would have to go and tell them there's a hundred fucking guys here, 150 guys sitting in, in this unit. Like there's no way I'm like the likelihood that they're going to pinpoint me and then go in through every single one. And if they do, he's like, yeah, what if they do? I said, then I'll say I lied. I lied. <laughs> I signed them. I signed their name. I said, what does it matter? And they're like, oh, bro, that's all oh, uh, right. So they get all upset. But I never went. I just never went. And I had guys actually come to me and say, I never see you in class. And I go, well, which one do you go to? Well, I go to the one at, at 6 o'clock. I go, oh, I, on what? Tuesdays? And they go, no, no, on Wednesdays and Fridays. I go, oh, I go to the one on Monday and such and such. Whatever. Whatever it was. To, and I had that. They didn't happen. go to. That's the one you went. Come on. Bro, you, you were a nightmare for a dedicated person like myself. All right. If we can do the, the 10 thinking errors, then I'm ready to start. Did you guys have a prize closet where they gave out prizes? Um, 
they did give, give out, out they did give out candy and stuff like that, but I don't know that we didn't call it a prize. It was something that was I think it was discretionary for Doctor Smith to to do herself, right? Or maybe the DTSs or whatever, because they all had like a little box in their unit where it was so like you want to feel like a child. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They'd be like, "You were doing so good. Pick two items out of the box." You'd be like, "Yeah, Skittles. Do you have Skittles? Yes, they had Skittles." <laughs> Which you could resell on the car. Co- yeah. Listen, Coke. But if you found sugared well, if, sodas, if you were caught oh, reselling yeah, them, yeah, it's booked out. All right, so let's do the thinking errors and we can start. Yeah. All right, so you said one. I can't remember the order, so one was definitely should. Should thoughts. I wonder if somebody blaming put- is one. Um. Honesty, respo- wait, honesty, responsibility, willingness, open mindedness, humility. Yes, I got all those right there. Caring, gratitude. Only, only because I knew the uh, acronym. Objectivity, gratitude. I got it all. Honesty, humility, open minded, gratitude, caring, responsibility, objectivity, willingness. What is that? Those are the the, the positive attitudes. Oh, for God's sakes! Oh, here it is. Um, Absolutes, I can't. I can't, yes. I can't, and there's another I one. There's rhetorical questions. Rhetorical questions, yes. <laughs> awfulizing. Yes. Which is, Jess says that to me. I'll be like, man, you know, this and this. She'll go, you're awfulizing, which yes. is hilarious. Wait, uh, statement of fact. Statement of fact, yes. He, she, it statements. Yes. Blaming. I got that. Um, loaded questions or words. He, she, it statements. Uh, loaded words. Loaded questions. Yeah. That's or, a rhetorical question. Or words. Loaded, loaded words. words. Yes. My, look, 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 look. Have to, need to, must. must. Have to. Oh, I that's, can't that was my believe that one. you just you just finished it with must. God, bro. Okay. You were you were an, you were a super dapper. What? What? Do you know they used to call me? To, oh, fucking put your cape on, yeah. Zach, with your super dapping yeah. ass. <laughs> should statements. I got should. Yeah. That's it. Blaming. That should so be have ten. to need to must rhetorical question. Awfulizing. I can't. There's another I one. It's um. It's probably one of these that's just altered. Right. Is that 10 of us? 10 of them, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There's another I. Thinking in generalizations over generalizing way. Making excuses for not doing something. There's another I when it'll come to me. That's good enough, though. All right. Are you ready? Jesus, making assumptions without knowing the fact. Oh, my God. Well, what? How long are we going to do? I want to walk out of here by noon. Oh, really? Yes. So it might have uh, to be a two-parter. Come on, no. let's go. We can no. do this. All right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> An hour and well, a half. By noon, you said you had till two. I have I have to be somewhere at two. Well, well, you, Bro, it's you, 30 miles back to my house, and it's past my house I have to be. <laughs> you'll be all right. Where Where is it? Just a, a Bradenton. A, um, is it another bank job? No, it's not another bank <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> I'm robbing a Bank of America. Yes, I'm always yeah. robbing a bank. No, it's 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 in Bradyton. It's a it's a doctor's appointment. I finally got Medicaid, so I'm happy. Nice, <laughs> getting the pills. All right, maybe. Uh, all right, so start start. All right, is this is See, the sound you, fine? Yeah, 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 yeah. You gotta you gotta do the closer, right? Me? Yeah. Right now you're doing this. And oh. I'm, so we both, you know, it's within basic. Okay. So if you need to pull it closer, pull it close. I know it seems funny with it right in your face. But, right. Okay. Um. Uh. What? Okay. So that's it, right? Yep. All right. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but when I was locked up, I wrote a whole bunch of true crime books, and all of the books are on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, Audible. They're eBooks. Check out the trailers. Using forgeries and bogus identities, Matthew B. Cox, one of the most ingenious con men in history, built America's biggest banks out of millions. Despite numerous encounters with bank security, state, and federal authorities, Cox narrowly, and quite luckily, 
avoided capture for years. Eventually, he topped the U.S. Secret Service's most wanted list and led the U.S. Marshals, FBI, and Secret Service on a three-year chase while jet-setting around the world with his attractive female accomplices. Cox has been declared one of the most prolific mortgage fraud con artists of all time by CNBC's American Greed. Bloomberg Businessweek called him the mortgage industry's worst nightmare, while Dateline NBC described Cox as a gifted forger and silver-tongued liar. Playboy magazine proclaimed his scam was real estate fraud, and he was the best. Shark in the Housing Pool is Cox's exhilarating first-person account of his stranger-than-fiction story. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Bent is the story of John J. Boziak's phenomenal life of crime. Inked from head to toe, with an addiction to strippers and fast Cadillacs, Boziak was not your typical computer geek. He was, however, one of the most cunning scammers, counterfeiters, identity thieves, and escape artists alive, and a major thorn in the side of the U.S. Secret Service as they fought a war on cybercrime. With a savant-like ability to circumvent banking security and stay one step ahead of law enforcement, Boziak made millions of dollars in the international cyber underworld with the help of the Chinese and the Russians. Then, leaving nothing but a John Doe warrant and a cleaned-out bank account in his wake, he vanished. Boziak's stranger-than-fiction tale of ingenious scams and impossible escapes, of brazen run-ins with the law and secret desires to straighten out and settle down, makes his story a true crime con game that will keep you guessing. Bent, how a homeless teen became one of the cybercrime industry's most prolific counterfeiters. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Buried by the US government and ignored by the national media, this is the story they don't want you to know. When Frank Amadeo met with President George W. Bush at the White House to discuss NATO operations in Afghanistan, no one knew that he'd already embezzled nearly $200 million from the federal government, money he intended to use to bankroll his plan to take over the world. From Amadeo's global headquarters in the shadow of Florida's Disney World, with a nearly inexhaustible supply of the Internal Revenue Service's funds, Amadeo acquired multiple businesses, amassing a mega conglomerate. Driven by his delusions of world conquest, he negotiated the purchase of a squadron of American fighter jets and the controlling interest in a former Soviet ICBM factory. He began work to build the largest private militia on the planet, over one million Africans strong. Simultaneously, Amadeo hired an international black ops force to orchestrate a coup in the Congo while plotting to take over several small Eastern European countries. The most disturbing part of it all is, had the U.S. government not thwarted his plans, he might have just pulled it off. It's insanity. The bizarre, true story of a bipolar megalomaniac's insane plan for total world domination. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Pierre Rossini, in the 1990s, was a 20-something-year-old Los Angeles-based drug trafficker of ecstasy and ice. He and his associates drove luxury European supercars, lived in Beverly Hills penthouses, and dated Playboy models while dodging federal indictments. Then, two FBI officers with the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force entered the picture. Dirty agents willing to fix cases and identify informants. Suddenly, two of Rossini's associates, confidential informants working with federal law enforcement, were murdered. Everyone pointed to Rossini. As his co-defendants prepared for trial, U.S. Attorney Robert Mueller sat down to debrief Rossini at Leavenworth Penitentiary, and another story emerged. A tale of FBI corruption and complicity in murder. You see, Pierre Rossini knew something that no one else knew. The truth. And Robert Mueller and the federal government have been covering it up to this very day. Devil Exposed. A twisted tale of drug trafficking, corruption, and murder in the City of Angels. Available on Amazon and Audible. Bailout is a psychological true crime thriller that pits a narcissistic conman against an egotistical pathological liar. Marcus Shrinker, 
the money manager who attempted to fake his own death during the 2008 financial crisis, is about to be released from prison, and he's ready to talk. He's ready to tell you the story no one's heard. Shrinker sits down with true crime writer Matthew B. Cox, a fellow inmate serving time for bank fraud. Shrinker lays out the details. The disgruntled clients who persecuted him for unanticipated market losses, the affair that ruined his marriage, and the treachery of his scorned wife, the woman who framed him for securities fraud, leaving him no choice but to make a bogus distress call and plunge from his multi-million dollar private aircraft in the dead of night. The $11.1 million in life insurance, the missing $1.5 million in gold. The fact is, Shrinker wants you to think he's innocent. The problem is, Cox knows Shrinker's a pathological liar and his story's a fabrication. As Cox subtly coaxes, cajoles, and yes, cons Shrinker into revealing his deceptions, his stranger-than-fiction life of lies slowly unravels. This is the story Shrinker didn't want you to know. Bailout, The Life and Lies of Marcus Shrinker. Available now on Barnes & Noble, Etsy, and Audible. Matthew B. Cox is a con man, incarcerated in the Federal Bureau of Prisons for a variety of bank fraud-related scams. Despite not having a drug problem, Cox inexplicably ends up in the prison's Residential Drug Abuse Program, known as RDAP, a drug program in name only. RDAP is an invasive behavior modification therapy specifically designed to correct the cognitive thinking errors associated with criminal behavior. The Program is a non-fiction dark comedy which chronicles Cox's side-splitting journey. This first-person account is a fascinating glimpse at the survivor-like atmosphere inside of the government-sponsored rehabilitation unit. While navigating the treachery of his backstabbing peers, Cox simultaneously manipulates prison policies and the bumbling staff every step of the way. The Program. How a con man survived the Federal Bureau of Prisons' cult of RDAP. Available now on Amazon and Audible. If you saw anything you like, links to all the books are in the description box.